So a thinker I like Lacan would talk about how love always orients itself to to a lack or a gap in the other. So for example, um, whenever, if I fall in love with someone but because they complete me because I think they're amazing and they're brilliant or whatever, that's kind of like a romantic love and it's 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 fun, right? Yeah. But, uh, Lacan once said, love is giving what you do not have to someone who does not want it. And, and what he kind of means by that is when you're really in love, there's something I don't have, like a, as in I feel incomplete and my desire is my lack, you know, and I give that to somebody and they don't really want it because they want somebody strong and perfect and wonderful and great. But somehow they take that lack and they enjoy it. And the reason why I say this is like whenever an artist loves beauty, they don't just love the beautiful and they just don't they don't just paint something and think that they can grasp the beautiful. The beautiful is always something that is lacking in every painting. It's mm. what it's what inspires you always. So you can never you can never create the most the beautiful painting. Beauty is something that is always present and absent at the same time. It's a ghost. A ghost is a present absence. And so beauty is like it's there. You feel it. You're immersed in it. And you're painting, but you can never grasp it. When you think you can grasp it, that's not love. That's fanaticism. If you think you can grasp the truth, um, whereas but the point is, you're not also. You can't grasp the truth, but also you can't get away from the truth. Because as soon as you talk about whether there's truth or not, we're assuming truth, right? We're, uh -huh. talk, we're assuming meaning. and we're, So you can't get away from truth, but you also can't grasp it. And that's for me what love is, is when you love someone or a cause, it's like you're with something that you're not with. You grasp something that you can't grasp. It's like the TARDIS and Doctor Who. The person is this fragile frame that's tiny, that's graspable, yeah. but their inner world is ungraspable. So love both has and has not. And, mm. and that the reason why I say that is so that you, because if, if you have an orientation to this openness of what you do not have, and if that's where you get your enjoyment, then you're never dissatisfied because, because you're satisfied in your dissatisfaction. You kind of enjoy. <laughs> so like, that's the whole point of problems with consumerism is always promise you'll be happy when you get the object, you know, this is going like, no, there's a certain not having that's enjoyable. Right. Yeah. In fact, preferable in many oh, instances, yeah. Yeah. right? It's fascinating some of the words we use here, and I've talked about this previously, but I'd love to run this by you real quick before we move on. In fact, I'll skip the right here, right now segment so we can talk about this. But we use these words like void, and we try to fill the void. That presupposes the void is a bad thing. Yeah. The lack is a bad thing. Yeah. But then when you go to Montana, you don't say, oh, my God, look at this void. We need to fill this this valley with yeah. stuff yes. or with people or whatever. And, and no, you enjoy the void and uh, that the fact that it is missing something is what makes it beautiful. Yes, 100 percent. And this is like a not just a kind of a poetic thing. I mean, even in the sciences, so you have in biology, the non at oneness of the biological organism is called evolution, evolutionary theory, which means that there's some sort of antagonism within biological organisms. In physics, it's called indeterminacy, the idea that reality itself has a certain kind of antagonism uh, or superpositioning. Uh, in politics, it's called democracy. The non at oneness of the social body with itself is called democracy. Um, in psychoanalysis, it's called the unconscious, which is the not at oneness of the of consciousness with itself. And the reason why I'm bringing out all of these different frames is it's we don't realize how um, something about lack or antagonism or contradiction is at the heart of love. It's a heart of subjectivity, but it's also at the heart of reality itself. And that's what makes everything. That's what gives everything what it is. So there's a way of thinking about nihilism in that sense. Um, but the beautiful, I'll say the beautiful thing about the, the writers of nihilism, and we're thinking of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and Dostoevsky, people like that, is that they're not nihilists as such. What they believe is that nihilism already is an event. It's already here, right? We already live, but we're denying it. And when we enter into it and when we actually embrace the darkness, when we have the courage to go into it fully, then we discover this new meaning, this new kind of way of life, way of being arises that that has a type of nothingness as part of it. Right? It's mm -hmm. part of its very structure. Yes. And, uh, it is required. The nothingness is what 
quote completes us yes. yeah. is maybe it, the, the the being accepting of the void, not in a prescriptive way, like do these three things and you'll accept the void, but simply understanding that that is part of it all, right? Yeah. The thing that makes a, a space beautiful or a life beautiful is often the lack. Yes. And this is, I mean, this is why I'm in Los Angeles, because Los Angeles is the most religious place in the world, right? It's the most religious Mecca. Um, now, when people hear you say that, oh yeah, oh, they yeah. Are, they're going to be bowled over, because what does that mean? I'm thinking of some place in Mississippi must be the most <laughs> religious place in the world. You mean something different. Yeah, well, just that it's a place of wholeness and completeness, certainty and satisfaction. Everybody mm -hmm. here is looking, there's prophets in every corner saying that you can be whole and complete if you have enough money, you look the right way, you have a certain amount of fame. The tyranny of happiness is everywhere in Los Angeles. It's quite incredible. It's palpable. The, um, you, you know, the, it's very difficult to be unhappy. To, you know, you can be, you know, to find a space to have the enjoyment of unhappiness here. So if you, th if you think of religion as the philosophy, the theory and the practice of wholeness, completeness, oneness, then, you know, Los Angeles is this secular religious Mecca. And what's interesting about nihilism or existentialism in particular is that this term, the death of God is fascinating. So it actually starts with St. Paul. The Apostle Paul is the first one to use it, right? He talks about the death of God. And it's a very bizarre phrase. Uh, and so this is in a cultic setting, and I mean cultic in its traditional sense of a provisional religious practice, right? Mm -hmm. Paul uses this word, death of God. And Paul doesn't even understand kind of what he's saying. He just says it and he says, this is central to salvation. Something about not the death of a God or a messenger of God. The death of God is something fundamentally, existentially world historical. Now, nobody really does anything with it until, say, Luther. Then Luther raises it to a theological concept. So Luther takes this notion of the death of God and, say, makes it theological. Then he Hegel, later, uh, he, he raises it to the dignity of philosophy. So with Hegel, this death of God becomes a philosophical concept. And then with Nietzsche, he returns to Paul. So he's very Pauline. He again says, the death of God is an existential event that we all have to go through. And then Freud it develops a technology to help people confront this. So I would, that's the kind of genealogy. But what connects all of these things together is the idea that disruption, distortion, decentering is central event that we have to experience, an experience of the death of meaning, the loss of all of our coordinates for why we're here, who we are, what we're doing. This event is something that is not just something we go through, but it's actually something we ought to embrace. It's something central. Like even every teenager kind of goes through a mini death of God, you know. Yes. Um, but there's something about this event that is so central existentially to the cure. The cure being to a new mode of life, a new mode of being freed from our libidinal investment and in objects that will satisfy us. Uh, free from these libidinally frenetic attempts to be happy, whole and complete. And once we undergo existentially that event and have the courage to do it, we then enter into the freedom to, the, and as Shizek would say, not the freedom to be happy, but the freedom from happiness. It's great to be free to be happy. Brilliant. Let's have the freedom to pursue what will make us happy. But we also need the space where we're free from the pursuit of what will make us happy. And that's what happens through the death of God. <laughs>